Well, hello again, everybody. It's nice to see you here today for session number seven. I can hardly believe it. Session number seven in our series, The Great Cosmic Controversy. And the subtitle is How God Clears His Name from All False Charges. Before we begin our study, which is part two of uh, the judgment in the most holy place, we want to ask for the Lord's blessing. And so I ask you to bow your heads with me as we implore God's presence. Father in heaven, we have a very solemn and important subject to study this evening, and we need the help of the Holy Spirit. So we ask that you will be present through the Spirit and through the angels, that you will give us understanding. There are many complex things that we're going to take a look at. at. I ask, Lord, that you will make everything clear to each person gathered here this evening, that you will make it clear also to those who are watching the live streaming and those who will watch on YouTube and on DVD and on television. I ask, Lord, that you will make this absolutely clear for your honor and your glory. And we thank you for hearing our prayer, for we ask it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, last evening we were studying uh, about the biblical concept of the judgment. And we answered a series of questions in our introductory subject yesterday. Number one, we answered the question, when does the judgment take place? And of course, the answer is that it takes place before the second coming of Christ. More specifically, it begins on October 22nd, 1844. Then we ask where the judgment takes place. And of course, the answer is that the judgment takes place in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. We also ask the question, who is judged in this stage of the judgment? And we notice that those who are judged are only those who claim the name of Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. The cases of the wicked are looked at later on in history. We also answered the question, why does God perform a work of judgment if God already knows everything? And the reason is because God needs to prove that He's been right in every case before the heavenly universe because they are not omniscient. Then we notice, just very briefly, the evidence that is examined in the judgment. And of course, the evidence is our life. The Bible calls it our works. And finally, we answer the question, can forgiveness be revoked? Once forgiveness has been given, can forgiveness be revoked? And we noticed that the Bible clearly teaches that if a person was not sincere, in repenting and in confessing their sin and had crocodile tears, so to speak, then that individual, when their name comes up in the judgment, the forgiveness that was granted without God questioning at that point in the daily service will be reversed or will be revoked. Now this evening we're going to study a little bit more about the process of the judgment. How does the process of the judgment take place? I'd like to begin by mentioning that the judgment began with those who first lived upon the earth. In other words, the judgment takes place chronologically. It takes place with those who first lived, it continues with successive generations, and finally ends up with the judgment of the living. I'd like to read a statement that we find in the book, The Great Controversy, page 483, where Ellen White makes it very clear who was first judged and how the judgment proceeds chronologically. This is how it reads. As the books of record are opened in the judgment, the lives of all who have believed on Jesus, we studied that last night, right? The lives of all those who have believed on Jesus come in review before God. Not the wicked, the righteous. She concludes the statement by saying, beginning with those who first lived upon the earth, our advocate presents the cases of each successive generation and closes with the living. So there's several interesting details here that are very important. The judgment is of those who believed on Jesus. And the judgment begins with those who first lived, which means that the first person to be judged would have been Adam. And then God takes up 
chronologically each successive generation and finally before the close of probation he ends with the judgment of the living. Now let's go in our Bibles to John chapter 5 and verses 28 and 29. If I was to ask you where are the dead today, I'm sure that as good Seventh-day Adventists, good Bible students, you would say that the dead are in their graves until Jesus comes. Not only the righteous, but also the wicked are in their graves. But we're concerned especially about the righteous. Now John 5, 28 and 29 clearly tells us where the dead are. I read, these are the words of Jesus. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear His voice. So where are the dead? In their graves. And then it says, and they shall come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of damnation. And of course we know that takes place after the thousand years. Jesus is not concerned here about the chronology of the two stages. He's simply saying that there are going to be two resurrections. So where are the dead today according to the testimony of Jesus? They are in their what? In their graves. What does the Christian world generally teach about the dead? If they were good, they went where? To heaven. If they were bad, they go where? To hell. And at least one church says if you're half bad or maybe half good, you go to purgatory. And if you had not reached the age of accountability, you go to limbo. All kinds of different spheres invented by human beings. But the Bible is clear that the dead are in their graves until the moment of the resurrection. But now we have a problem. We mentioned that the first individual to be judged in 1844 would have been whom? Adam. Now the question is where was Adam in 1844 when the judgment began? He was in his grave. So here is the big question. How could he be the first to appear before the judgment seat of Christ if he was dead and he was buried? Are you understanding my problem? Now it's not really a problem when we look at what the Bible has to say about this. I want to read from Great Controversy, page 482, where Ellen White explains how Adam appeared before Christ's judgment seat in 1844. This is how it reads. The righteous dead will not be raised until after the judgment at which they are accounted worthy of the resurrection of life. So notice, the righteous dead will not be raised until after the judgment at which they are accounted worthy of the resurrection of life. In other words, the judgment takes place first to show that they are what? That they are worthy, and after that they are given their reward. She finishes the statement by saying, Hence, they will not be present in person at the tribunal when their records are examined and their case is decided. So how did Adam appear before the judgment seat of Christ in 1844? It was through his records. It was through the record of his life. He did not appear there personally. He appeared there through his biographical record that God kept in heaven. Now when we read the Bible, we find that the Bible speaks of books, plural, and book, singular, uh, in relationship to the judgment. Now, when the Bible speaks about the book, singular, it's referring to a book that contains the names of all of those who claim to have received Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. So the book, singular, has names. The books, plural, contain the life record or the biography of the individual. Now, I want us to notice, uh, for example, that our good deeds are kept in a book, according to the Bible. We find this in, uh, uh, in a uh, very important uh, text. Uh, it reads in the following way. This is Psalm 56 and verse 8. In the book, actually this is from Ellen White, and then we'll notice uh, a text from Scripture. It is from Psalm 56 and verse 8, but I'm commenting now from Ellen White. In the book of God's remembrance, every, de every deed of righteousness is immortalized. There are every temptation resisted, every evil overcome, 
every word of tender pity expressed is faithfully chronicled, and every act of sacrifice, every suffering and sorrow endured for Christ's sake is recorded. That's Great Controversy, page 481. So the question is, are the good deeds of those who receive Jesus Christ written in a book? Yes. But also, in other books, the evil deeds are written as well. Now let's notice several texts in Scripture that refer to the books, plural. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether what? Whether good or bad. Does God keep a record of our actions, whether they are good or bad? He most certainly does. What about our words? Does God keep a record of our words in heaven as well? Certainly. Notice Matthew chapter 12, verses 36 and 37. Jesus is speaking and He says, But I say to you, that for every idle word men may speak, they will give account of it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Does God keep a record of our words, good and evil? According to Matthew chapter 12, the testimony of Jesus, absolutely. God also keeps a record of the secrets of our hearts. Notice Ecclesiastes chapter 12, and we'll read verses 13 and 14. Ecclesiastes 12, 13 and 14. It reads there, Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is man's all. For God will bring every work into judgment. So if God is going to bring works into judgment, does God keep a record of our works? Of course. God will bring every work into judgment, and now notice, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. So does God keep a record also of the secret things that human beings don't see? Absolutely. Notice 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 5. Once again, it tells us that the secrets will come back uh, to face us in the judgment. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 5 speaks about God unsealing the secrets of hearts. By the way, it has nothing to do with secrets unsealed. He is going to unseal the secrets of the hearts. This is how it reads. Therefore judge nothing before the time, until the Lord comes, who will bring, who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of the hearts. So does God keep a record of us inside and out? Words, actions, secret things, good deeds. That's what is contained in the books, plural, books. Now notice Daniel chapter 7 verses 9 and 10. Now the context of this is that the little horn, and the little horn of course represents the papacy. Does the papacy profess to serve Christ? Does the papacy profess to be a Christian system? It most certainly does. So would uh, those who belong to this system uh, appear in the judgment before the second coming? Absolutely. And uh, so in Daniel 7, 9 and 10, it's speaking about the judgment sitting to uh, take care of the cases of all of those individuals who were mistreated and who were persecuted by this little horn system. And God in the judgment is going to set things right. Now notice for Daniel chapter 7, verses 9 and 10. I watched till thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was as white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. A thousand thousands ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated, and the books, plural, were opened. So all of the cases of those individuals who persecuted God's people during the 1260 years are going to come forth in the judgment. Now that doesn't mean that, that only that is going to be looked at in the judgment before the second coming of Christ. Simply Daniel 7 is emphasizing that it's those who were persecuted by the little horn because that is the subject that is being discussed. It's kind of like people say, just to digress a little bit, people say, well, you know, the Sabbath was for the Jews because God gave it to the Jews. 
But nowhere in the Bible does it say that God gave it exclusively to the Jews. It does say that God gave it to the Jewish nation because they were God's people at the time when the Ten Commandments were given. But it doesn't mean that it applied only to them. And so this judgment of the little horn doesn't mean that only those who lived during the 1260 years are being looked at. Leviticus chapter 16 tells us that all of those who profess the name of Jesus uh, before the second coming of Christ come into this judgment. Now notice Revelation chapter 20 verses 12 and 13. I want you to see that there's a difference between the books which contain the biographical record of the individual and book singular which contains names. It says here, and by the way this is speaking about the judgment after the millennium, however uh, in principle that judgment is going to function in the same way as the judgment before the second coming of Christ. It says there, and I saw the dead small and great standing before God, and books were opened, and another book was opened. Do you see that there are books and book? It says another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged according to their what? To their works by the things which were written in the books. So what is it that is found written in the books? People's what? Works. It says they were judged by their works, by the things which are written in the books. So the books contain the life record and the book singular contains the names of individuals in chronological order according to when they received Jesus Christ or claimed to receive Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. In other words, in the heavenly books God has a complete record of the life of every single individual. Every act, every word, every motive, every thought, every emotion, even every opportunity to do good which perhaps we did not take advantage of. There is a complete biographical record in heaven inside and out without missing a single detail. In other words there is another Stephen Bohr in heaven in written form. Doesn't mean that he's up there living, doesn't mean that there's a guy living here and there's another, uh, another one of me up there living also. It simply means that God keeps in heaven a biographical record of myself without missing anything inside or out. Now Ellen White used the example of photography when she talked about God keeping records. You see God speaks to the prophet in the language that the prophet uh, is accustomed to in his day and age. You know if John had talked about uh, God keeping records by photography they would have said what's that? So they use the word books because that's the way records were kept. But I believe that if God today uh, was, wanted to explain to us how He uh, keeps records and how He retrieves them, He would probably speak about video cameras, uh, video cameras and hard drives and computers because that's what we are accustomed to. It's our way of storing information which by the way is much more efficient than written records. But Ellen White used the example of photography because photography was coming in when Ellen White lived. I want to read you a couple of statements. The first is found in the devotional book In Heavenly Places, page 360. As the artist takes on the polished glass a true picture of the human face, so the angels of God daily place upon the books of heaven, notice, daily place upon the books of heaven an exact representation of the character of every human being. The second statement is in the book Testimonies on Sexual Behavior, Adultery and Divorce, page 62, where she states, remember, your character is being daguerreotyped. We don't use that word anymore. It means photographed, basically. Remember, your character is being photographed by the great master artist in the record books of heaven as minutely as the face is reproduced upon the polished plate of the artist. And so God keeps an exact transcript and record of our lives inside and out Good deeds, bad deeds, words, actions, motivations, feelings, you name it, everything is written in the books. So do you understand what is contained in the books? I hope so. Now let's talk about what is contained in the book. I mentioned that what is in the book is names. Let's read several verses. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 3. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 3. 
Here Paul is talking about several of his fellow laborers in the gospel, and he states the following, And I urge you also, true companion, help these women who labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. So what does the book of life contain? Not the actions, it contains what? The names. Notice Revelation chapter 3 and verse 5. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 5. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. So once again, what does the book contain? The book contains names. Notice Revelation chapter 13 and verse 8. Revelation 13 and verse 8. It's speaking about those who worship the beast. It says, All who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of the life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Once again, what is written in the book? Names are contained in the book. You remember when Moses uh, was on the mount that Israel worshipped the golden calf? And God said, I'm going to wipe out these people, I'm going to choose another nation. You remember that Moses interceded before the Lord. And notice what Moses had to say. This is Exodus chapter 32 and verses 31 to 33. Then Moses returned to the Lord and said, All these people have committed a great sin and have made for themselves a God of gold. Yet now, Moses is speaking to the Lord, yet now if you will forgive their sin, but if not, I pray, blot me out of your book which you have written. In other words, strike my name from your book if you cannot save these people. One more text on the book itself. Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1. Daniel 12 verse 1 is speaking about uh, the deliverance of God's people from the powers of the earth at the end of time. It says there in Daniel 12 verse 1, At that time Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. And at that time your people shall be delivered, they need to be delivered because according to the previous verses, uh, the king of the north and his cohorts wanted to obliterate them from the earth. So it says, your people shall be delivered, everyone who is found what? Written in the book. So what does the book contain? Names. Names. In the chronological order in which they received Jesus Christ or claimed to receive Jesus Christ as Savior. What is it that is contained in the books? It is the biographical record, an exact transcript of the life of the people. Now we need to take a look at something which is very, very important. You know, Seventh-day Adventist evangelists, uh, when, we, when they preach about the state of the dead, uh, basically they say the spirit that returns to God is simply the breath. Now I believe that the spirit has to do with the breath, but there's more to the spirit than just the breath. And you're saying, what are you talking about? You see, the Spirit uh, is the breath, but when God returns the breath, if a person should die, He's not only going to return the capacity to breathe, He is going to return to that person who they were while they were alive. In other words, along with the breath of life, God is going to give them their biographical record. Are you following me? And that is the Spirit. The Spirit is the breath along with the, the identity that the person formed during their life. I want to prove that from Scripture and from the spirit of prophecy. You remember the daughter of Jairus, she died and people were mourning her. And I want you to notice the, the end of the story in Luke 8 verses 52 to 56. Now all wept and mourned for her, but he said, Do not weep, she is not dead but sleeping. And they ridiculed him, knowing that she was dead. So was the little girl dead? Clearly, people knew she was dead. But he put them all outside, took her by the hand, and called, saying, Little girl, arise. In other words, little girl, resurrect. Now, sometimes, uh, you know, my glasses don't, don't allow me to read uh, things 
exactly the way they're written. So if I read something wrong, you please correct me, okay? So it says in verse 55, Then the Spirit returned. Is that what it says? Then the Spirit returned? No. A possessive pronoun is used. Her Spirit returned. And she arose immediately. And he commanded that she be given something to eat. See, when she died, she was hungry. And so when she was resurrected, she picked up where she left off. Why? Because along with her breath, what was she given? Her personal identity that she had while she was alive. Are you following me or not? Very important point. Let me ask you, would it be kind of, a, kind of tragic if the Lord, when He resurrected me, He only would give me the capacity to breathe and wouldn't, give me who, uh, wouldn't make me who I was while I was alive? That, that would be kind of funny, wouldn't it? Imagine me receiving... Uh, receiving the breath of life and being Barney. <laughs> you, see, you say, now come on, wait a minute, there's, there's something incongruous here. Now notice another example. This is the stoning of Stephen, Acts 7, 57 to 60. It says, uh, speaking about those who wanted to stone and kill Stephen, it says, Then they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears, and ran at him with one accord. And they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. And they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive the Spirit. No, he says, receive my Spirit. What is Stephen saying? He's saying, preserve my self-identity. Keep the record, Lord. Verse 60, then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Once again, the possessive pronoun, my spirit. Notice the third example, Luke 23 and verse 46. This is referring to the death of Jesus on the cross. It says there, And when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commend the spirit. It does not say the spirit. It's a possessive pronoun. Into your hands I commend my spirit. Having said, said this, he breathed his last. What was Jesus say, uh, saying to his father? Into your hands I commend my spirit. He was saying, Father, preserve my identity because you promised that you were going to what? That you were going to resurrect me. When Jesus resurrected, was it still Jesus? Could he remember his disciples? Did he remember where he had been? Did he remember that Peter had betrayed him? Did he remember that, that Judas had, uh, had betrayed him as well? Yeah, he knew all of those things. Why? Because along with his breath, what was given to him? His personal self-identity, which was preserved or kept in heaven. Now allow me to read you an extraordinary statement written by Ellen White. Uh, the little lady knew this. She had only two and a half years of primary education. And yet she knew this very clearly. This is found in the book Maranatha, a devotional book, page 301. Our personal identity is preserved in the resurrection. What is preserved in the resurrection? Our personal identity. Then she says, though not the same particles of matter or some material substance as went into the grave. Does, God doesn't have to return to us the identical particles of dust that, that composed our body. She continues saying, the wondrous works of God are a mystery to man. The spirit, comma, the character of man, comma, is returned to God there to be preserved. What is it that God preserves? Our character, who we are, she's saying. And she calls it the spirit. She continues saying uh, uh, in this statement, in the resurrection, every man will have his own character. God in his own time will call forth the dead, giving them again the breath of life and bidding the dry bones live. The same form will come forth, but it will be free from disease and every defect. It lives again, bearing the same individuality of features, so that friend will recognize friend. There is no law of God in nature which shows that God gives back the same identical particles of matter which compose the body before death. God shall give the righteous dead a body that will please Him. A perfect body, by the way. In fact, in the same page, 301 of the book Maranatha, 
uh, Ellen White explains, Paul illustrates this subject uh, of uh, the new body that God is going to give us by the kernel of grain that is sown in the field. The planted kernel decays, but there comes forth a new kernel. The natural substance in the grain that decays is never raised as before, but God giveth it a body as it hath pleased Him. A much finer material will compose the human body, for it is a new creation, a new birth. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. Now we can understand a little bit better Job 19 and verses 25 to 27. I used to wonder about this. It sounded kind of selfish on the part of Job, what he was saying. But now I understand why he used all these personal pronouns. He says in Job 19, 25 to 27, For I know that my Redeemer lives, and he shall stand on the earth, and after my skin is destroyed, this I know, that in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another. So nobody else is going to see Jesus when he comes, according to Job. He says, my eyes are going to see him, and no one else. You know what he's really saying? He's really saying, it's going to be me that is going to see him. It's not going to be somebody else. Because God is going to return to me, what? The identity that I had while I was, what? While I was alive. Are you understanding this? So how do people appear before the judgment seat of Christ? Do they appear there personally, beginning in 1844? No. They appear there through their what? Through their records. Does this have anything to do with the state of the dead? It's a total contradiction of the con concept that the Christian world has of the state of the dead. Because if you believe that people go to heaven or to hell, then you can never believe that the judgment began at a certain point, because when people died is when they received their reward. Are you following me or not? So if you believe that the judgment begins at a certain point, and God begins to judge, beginning with Adam, through the course of history, and people are in their graves, then it must be that people are being judged by the record of their lives, and not because they are there personally. And then when Jesus comes, He will give the reward personally, depending on what was revealed in the books. Are you following me or not? It's actually very simple. Now there's another point that I want us to notice about the judgment. Sometimes we emphasize so much what the high priest did in the most holy place on the Day of Atonement, that we forget that there was a response that was expected by the people outside the sanctuary. We virtually ignore what the people had to be doing on the Day of Atonement because we're so intent on saying that Jesus is in heaven, He's cleansing the heavenly sanctuary from the sins of the people. Ellen White, in the book Great Controversy, page 425, had this to say, While the investigative judgment is going forward in heaven, while the sins of the penitent believers are being removed from the sanctuary, there is to be a special work of purification, of putting away of sin among God's people upon the earth. There is to be a parallel work here. While Jesus is cleansing the heavenly sanctuary from the sins of the people, the people on earth should be cleansing their lives from sin, the soul temple from sin, if you please. Let's read in Leviticus 23, verses 27 to 32, what the people were supposed to do on the Day of Atonement. We're not talking now about the work of the high priest in the most holy place. He would examine the records in figure, and then he would cleanse the sanctuary from the sins of the people. Now we're going to take a look at what the people were expected to do. Once again, Leviticus 23, and beginning with verse 27. Also the tenth day of this seventh month shall be the Day of Atonement. It shall be a holy convocation. Everybody was expected to gather around the sanctuary and to focus their minds on what the high priest was doing. That's why the high priest had bells around the bottom of his garment so that people could follow him, so that people could knew what he was doing at any given moment. It continues saying, You shall afflict your souls, beat your chest because of your sins, in other words. You shall afflict your souls and offer an offering made by fire to the Lord and you shall do no work on that same day. Because if they were working, they could not concentrate on what was happening in the sanctuary. 
It was a day in which they were to be focused on what the high priest was doing. He was going to cleanse the sanctuary from sin. And so they, there, the time was coming when they could not continue putting sin into the sanctuary. She uh, it continues saying here in the book of Leviticus, verse 28, And you shall do no work on that same day, for it is the day of atonement, to make atonement for you before the Lord your God. For any person who is not afflicted in soul on that same day shall be cut off from his people. And any person who does any work on that same day, that person I will destroy from among his people. You shall do no manner of work. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. It shall be to you a Sabbath of solemn rest, and you shall afflict your souls on the ninth day of the month at evening. From evening to evening you shall celebrate your Sabbath. So what were they supposed to do? They were supposed to, first of all, afflict their souls. They were to fast. They were to congregate and focus on what was happening in the sanctuary. They were to be searching their lives to see if their lives had sin that had not entered into the sanctuary and therefore could not be cleansed from the sanctuary. It's interesting to notice that um, this festival was announced by the sound of trumpets. I'm going to give several characteristics now because we're going to go to another passage in a moment. The, the Day of Atonement was announced by the blowing of trumpets so that everybody would prepare for the Day of Atonement. As I mentioned, while the high priest was purifying the sanctuary or cleansing the sanctuary from the sins of the people, the people were supposed to be gathered outside afflicting their souls and doing uh, all in their power that God had given them to overcome sin. Also, they were supposed to fast. You say, well, do we fast since 1844? Well, we'd all be dead if we were fasting since 1844. We need to understand what fasting is. The Bible defines fasting in two ways. Medical Ministry, page 283, Ellen White explains, The true fasting, which should be recommended to all, is abstinence from every stimulating kind of food and the proper use of wholesome, simple food which God has provided in abundance. That's the true fast. So in other words, health reform is the true fast. Another definition that the Bible gives of fasting is that we take our clothing and we take our food to feed those who are in need. Notice Isaiah 58 verses 6 and 7. God speaking to Israel. Is this not the fast that I have chosen to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free, and that you break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and that you bring to your house the poor who are cast out when you see the naked that you cover him and not hide yourself from your own flesh? In other words, fasting is practical Christianity. It's practicing healthful living according to Scripture and the spirit of prophecy. So it doesn't mean that we had to have to abstain from food since 1844 when we understand what fasting is. Now, we also notice that Israel was supposed to abstain from work. Does that mean that we don't have to work from 1844 forward? Some people would like that, but that's not what it means. The reason why they were not supposed to work is because nothing was to interfere with their having their minds focused on what was happening in the sanctuary. And therefore, anything today that distracts us from what is taking place in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary, we should discard and do away with. Because our mind should be in there with Jesus, knowing that He's cleansing the sanctuary from the record of sin. And therefore, through His grace and power, we should be doing a parallel work through the power of the Holy Spirit to overcome sin in our lives. Incidentally, you noticed that people who did not sympathize on the Day of Atonement with what was happening in the sanctuary, the Bible says that they would be cut off and destroyed from among the people. How serious is it then that God's people be doing this during the Day of Atonement? You know, you have Adventist churches today that, that think that, you know, the worship service should be jumping up and down and rolling in the aisles and laughing and, and shouting and having drums and, and all dancing in church and everything, you know, because we should be filled with joy and with happiness. I'm not saying that we shouldn't be joyful. What I'm saying is that the Day of Atonement is a day of affliction. It's a day of fasting. 
It's a day of soul searching. It's a day to focus on the cleansing of the sanctuary, following Jesus by faith and overcoming sin in the life. Does God expect victory over sin from His people in the end time generation? Notice Revelation chapter 6. I'm not going to read verses 14 to 17. I'm only going to read verse 17. But verse 14 through verse 16 is describing the second coming of Jesus Christ. And I want you to notice that after describing the second coming, a solemn question is asked. And that's found in verse 17. For the great day of His wrath has come, and who shall be able to stand? So the question is, when Jesus comes, who shall be able to stand? Where would you expect to find the answer to that question? How about in the very next chapter? You think that would be a good place to look? You look at the very next verse, it speaks about the sealing of the 144,000. The 144,000 are those who will be alive when Jesus comes. They are the ones who were going to go through the time of trouble. They are the ones who will live on the earth without an intercessor. They will be the ones who will be subjects of a death decree. They will be individuals who, who will suffer the anguish of the time of Jacob's trouble. And the question is, when Jesus comes, who shall be able to stand? The answer is, the living saints, the 144,000, will be able to stand. Now, Revelation 7 does not give us the characteristics of 144,000. It says that they are sealed before the winds of strife are released and the tribulation comes. But Revelation 14 gives us their character qualities. I'll mention only four of them. You can read the whole passage, Revelation 14, 1 through 5. They follow the Lamb wherever He goes. They were not defiled with women. That doesn't mean that they didn't get married, because marriage doesn't defile you unless you commit adultery. <laughs> then that defiles. In other words, they did not have illicit relations with the apostate churches, because women represent what? Uh, harlots represent apostate churches. We are also told that there was no deceit in their mouths. So if there's no deceit in their mouth, is there any deceit in their hearts? No, because from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, according to the Bible. And we are told there that they are without fault before the throne of God. They will be totally victorious over sin because they will have followed Jesus into the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. They will have gained totally the victory, and therefore, in the great day of God's wrath, they will be able to stand. By the way, do you know that this is not the only time that this question is asked? The great day of His wrath has come, who shall be able to stand? If you read Joel chapter 2 and verses 1 through 10, you find a description of the second coming of Jesus Christ. I wish we had time to read those 10 verses, but we don't. But you can read them at leisure. The first 10 verses of Joel 2 describe the second coming of Christ. And then you come to verse 11, which is the culmination of this passage regarding the second coming. And it says there in verse 11, The Lord gives voice before His army. Remember in Revelation 19 it says that the armies of heaven follow Jesus when He comes on white horses? Well, this is what this is referring to. The Lord gives voice before His army, for His camp is very great, for strong is the one who executes His word. And then notice the question. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. Who can endure it? Is that a similar question to Revelation 6, 17? Yes, very similar. Where would you expect to find the answer to that question in verse 11? How about verses 12 to 17? Now we don't have time to read those verses, but I'll give you a summary of what those verses contain. They contain everything relating to the Day of Atonement. For example, they contain the sound of trumpets, which sounded before the Day of Atonement. It says there that it was a convocation. People needed to gather around the sanctuary. There it says in Joel. It speaks about God's people returning to God with all their hearts, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Does that sound like the Day of Atonement? Absolutely. It says there that they should rend their hearts and not their garments. We're told there that a, a, an assembly, a fast should be called. 
the, the assembly should be sanctified. It also tells us that the ministers should weep between the porch and the altar saying, Lord, spare your people. It's parallel to Ezekiel chapter 9 where it says, uh, it speaks about those who sigh and cry because of the abominations that are being done in the earth. That's what ministers should be doing today. Sighing and crying because of the abominations that are being committed among God's people. So the question is once again in Joel 2.11, For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. Who can endure it? The following verses tell us, it is those who experience the day of atonement. Those who go through the steps that are spoken of in Leviticus chapter 23. By the way, these are not the only two passages where you find uh, this question. Let's notice a few other passages that, that have the same question. Psalm 15. Notice how Psalm 15 begins. Lord, who may abide in your tabernacle? That's the sanctuary, right? Who may abide in your tabernacle? And then a second question, who may dwell in your holy hill? What is God's holy hill? Zion. Where do the 144,000 stand according to the book of Revelation? Zion. Where do they serve God? In His temple day and night, right? So is there any connection here? Absolutely. Now notice the answer. The answer has to do with your lifestyle. You say, well, Pastor Boy, you're saying then that we're saved by our lifestyle. No, no. What I'm saying is, you're saved because your mind is with Jesus in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. And because of that you're seeing His perfection and His holiness, how much sin costs, and by His grace you're overcoming sin in your life because your, your mind is focused there. Are you following me or not? Now notice what, what the answer is. It has to do with our conduct. It says there in verse 2, He who walks uprightly and works righteousness, and speaks the truth in his heart. He who does not backbite with his tongue, nor does evil to his neighbor, nor does he take up a reproach against his friend, in whose eyes a vile person is despised, but he honors those who fear the Lord. He who swears to his own hurt and does not change. He who does not put out his money at usury, nor does he take a bribe against the innocent. He who does these things shall never be moved. Who shall be able to stand? This kind of person shall never be moved. Are you seeing the connection or not? Does this have anything to do with our lifestyle? It most certainly does. The lifestyle does not save us, but our lifestyle shows our connection to Jesus. Notice another place where the question is asked. Isaiah 33 verses 14 through 16. All of these are describing the second coming of Jesus. And the question is, who will be able to stand? Who will be able to live with the Lord? Isaiah 33 verses 14 through 16. The sinners in Zion are afraid. Fearfulness has seized the hypocrites. And now here's the question. Who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? You know what Christians, most Christian churches were answered? Oh, it's the wicked that are going to be in the everlasting burnings. That's not what the Bible teaches. See, the wicked could never live with the devouring fire and the everlasting burnings because the fire would burn them up. But here it says the righteous will live in the presence of the fire. And now I want you to notice why. Verse 15 has the answer. He who walks righteously and speaks uprightly, he who despises the gain of oppressions, who gestures with his hands refusing bribes, who stops his ears from hearing of bloodshed, and shuts his eyes from seeing evil. He will dwell on high. That's Mount Zion, by the way. His place of defense will be the fortress of rocks. Bread will be given here. Him, his water, will be sure. Are you catching the picture? Ah, I want to share one more place where the question is asked. Psalm 24 and verses 3 to 6. This is the psalm of the ascension of Christ, but it also is the song that is going to be sung when Jesus comes to take his people home. Notice Psalm 24, verse 3. Who may ascend to the hill of the Lord? That's Mount Zion, right? Who may stand in His holy place? Notice the answer. He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is Jacob, the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face. Are you catching the picture? 
Will the end time generation be totally victorious over sin? In action and in thought, yes. And you say, it's impossible. Then you're saying that your sin is more powerful than God. No. See, people say, well, you know, we have a sinful nature. We have a sinful nature that sins, so it's not possible to stop sinning before Jesus comes. You're not really saying that man has a weak sinful nature. What you're saying is that God is not powerful enough to give you the victory over your sinful nature. You're limiting the power of God, is, that, is what you're doing. Great Controversy, page 623. Ellen White makes this remarkable statement, and you know those who don't believe that uh, vic the victory over sin can be gained before Jesus comes, they cringe when they read this statement. Great Controversy 623. Now, while our great high priest is making the atonement for us, we should seek to become perfect in Christ. Not even by a thought could our Savior be brought to yield to the power of temptation. Not even by a thought. Satan finds in human hearts some point where he can gain a foothold. Some sinful desire is cherished by means of which his temptations assert their power. But Christ declared of Himself, The Prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in Me. Now listen carefully. Satan could find nothing in the Son of God that would enable him to gain the victory. He had kept his Father's commandments, and there was no sin in him that Satan could use to his advantage. And now comes the amazing conclusion. This is the condition in which those must be found who shall stand in the time of trouble. Not even by a sinful what? By a sinful thought, according to the spirit of prophecy. You say, that's impossible. No, it's not impossible if we meet the conditions. If we behold the perfection of Christ and start, stop looking at all that garbage that, that we see everywhere. And, and stop listening to all the garbage that we listen to. If we focus on Jesus, His perfection, and what sin costs, the pain that it causes, then we can gain victory over sin. Now allow me to mention one more thing as we close. And that is that the distinctive beliefs of the Seventh-day Adventist Church are centered in the most holy place. The very doctrines that the Christian world despises are found in the most holy place. And do you know why? Because they have not entered the most holy place with Jesus. Let's review these. Let me ask you, where is the law of God to be found in the sanctuary? It is found in the most holy place of the sanctuary. Let me ask you, what is the, at the very center of the law? The seal. The Sabbath is at the center of the law. By the way, did God give the Sabbath to Israel as a test? Yes. Do you know that in the ark in heaven there is a pot that contains manna? Perhaps God is trying to tell us that the Sabbath in the end time will not only be one of, one of God's commandments, but the Sabbath is going to be a what? A test to see if God's people will walk in His what? In His law, as it says in Exodus 16. Ellen White says that the Sabbath will be a test at the end of time. There you have the manna in the Ark of the Covenant, in the most holy place, which is a symbol of the Sabbath as a test. Is a healthful diet revealed in the sanctuary? The pot of manna also teaches healthful living, doesn't it? You remember in Numbers chapter 11, the experience of Israel? They were tired of eating manna, this vegan food. They said, blah, you know, we remember all of the rich, delicious food in Egypt, you know, all the flesh pots and, and all this rich food, and we just wish we could have that food instead of having this simple diet that God has given us. And what happened? They got sick and they died. Is God trying to teach health reform in the most holy place of the sanctuary? He most certainly is. Let me ask you, does the most holy place have anything today to say about the judgment? Of course, it's done in the most holy place. Does it have anything to say about the state of the dead? We've noticed that, folks. Listen carefully. If Adam was the first to be judged in 1844, then he's not in heaven. Are you following me? If in 1844 it begins with Adam and it goes through all of the succeeding generations, where are the dead? 
the dead are in their graves. How are they judged? Through their records. When will they go to heaven? When Jesus comes. Are you following me? So does a correct concept of the judgment give us a correct concept of the state of the dead? Absolutely it does. And of course God also wanted to teach this issue of the, of the state of the dead uh, through Aaron's rod that miraculously sprouted to life. Though it was dead, by a miracle of God it sprouted to life. Just like Jesus says, though you are dead, yet you shall what? You shall live by a miracle of God. Now let me ask you, what does the Christian world have to say about God's law? Oh, it was nailed to the cross. Yeah. You know, Christ kept, us for, kept the law for us. You know, we're not under law, we're what? We're under grace. We don't live by the, by the letter, we live by the Spirit. The law is despised. What does the Christian world say about the Sabbath? Oh, the Sabbath was for the Jews. The Sabbath is a legalistic day. We keep Sunday in honor of the resurrection. If their minds were in the most holy place, which day would they be keeping? The Sabbath, because they would see that the earthly sanctuary was a copy of the heavenly. The Ark of the Covenant on earth had the law and the Sabbath, therefore the Ark of the Covenant in heaven, which Revelation 11:19 says is there, also must have the law, and it also must contain what? The Sabbath. What does the Christian world say about healthful living? They say, you know, the only thing you have to do for your pork chops to be blessed is simply to say a little prayer. And so the unclean pork chops suddenly will become clean by a miracle of God. And they use, the, like the experience of uh, arise, kill, and eat, you know, and they use texts uh, outside of the context of Scripture to defend the idea of eating anything and everything. What does the Christian world say about the state of the dead? Oh, they say that the state of the dead simply means that when a person dies, if they were good, they go to heaven, and if they were bad, they go straight to hell. Are you following me or not? What does the Christian world have, have to say about all of these things? They have, they're totally opposed to the distinctive doctrines of the Seventh-day Adventist Church because they have refused to what? to enter the most holy place where these truths are revealed. And these are the truths that are going to divide the world at the end of time. Do we have a special message as the Seventh-day Adventist Church to share these truths with the world? Amen. We most certainly do. And woe to us if we don't lead people in the world to a most holy place experience where they can see the fullness of truth and make a decision, a final decision, to receive Jesus Christ and live for Him.